in Accra. I am Stephen Nanti. In our headlines this afternoon, COVID-19 cases in Ghana now 5,127 after 427 new cases were added, 272 being from Obwasi. And on the foreign front, World Health Organization warns more than half a million people in sub-Saharan Africa could die between now and next year from AIDS-related illness amid the COVID-19 pandemic. With all these stories, plus the very latest in sports, business and international news coming up over the hour. Now, the Appointments Committee of Parliament is currently vetting President Kufuado's Supreme Court Justice nominee, Emmanuel Yone Kolende. Let's listen to him answering questions from the minority leader, Haruna Idrisu, at the ongoing vetting. You will be at the highest court, as chairman alluded to, the Supreme Court of Ghana, as you know, exercises exclusive jurisdiction over interpretation of the Constitution. Now, in the Monica Lewinsky case in the U.S., one of the famous senators said that the rule of law, the rule of law, nothing less, nothing more, but all persons being subjected to the law, What's your view on the audio terrain pattern rule in law, and how will you use that to protect the rights and interests of all other persons under the law? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the audio terrain pattern rule, as you appreciate, is a fundamental rule of law that you do not convict or make a judgment on a man until you have heard his side of the story. It's, it's, it's what we say in common parlance that uh, you don't tie, for me who comes from the north, you don't tie a single tuber of yam. They always have to be two. So you must always hear the other side of the story before you reach a conclusion. This is fundamental to the essence of law. And any judicial determination that offends this rule um, is impugned in an irretrievable way and occasions a complete nullity. And it, both as a matter of common sense and as, as a person with a common law orientation, I, I believe that ought to be the case of any judicial determination properly so-called. Chairman, may I respectively refer the nominee to Article 131 of the 1992 Constitution to get his view on the right of appeal. And Chairman, with your indulgence, I read, an appeal shall lie from a judgment of the Court of Appeal to the Supreme Court. My interest in this matter is A, as of right in a civil or criminal cause or matter in respect of which an appeal has been brought to the court of appeal from a judgment of the high court. What is your view? Should the words as of right necessarily be part of this constitutional provision? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, for now, that is the law, and there's a lot of sense and logic why in all, crim in all matters, civil or criminal, the citizen can be permitted a right of audience by way of appeal true to the apex court of the land. Mr. Chairman, after all, the Supreme Court is the final court. And so in, in matters where the citizen is minded so to do, um, the citizen should be able to access the highest court of the land. 
that said, from my experience as a practitioner, um, this outright door, as of right, to the Supreme Court, um, literally, in some cases, opens a floodgate into the court. And therefore, it, however frivolous a party's case may be, and however compelling a decision and reasoning of a trial court and an appellate court may be, the party can automatically access the highest court of the land. Uh, this has occasioned, if you want, a lot of traffic and jam in the Supreme Court. It's, it's a right that citizens ought to have, but it is amenable to abuse. Um, is there, therefore, the need to consider some filtering of that automatic access? I don't know. It's, it's, I, I, I can just tell you the And COVID-19 cases in Ghana have risen to 5,127 after 427 new cases were added. 272 of those new cases are from uh, Obwasi in the Ashanti region. At a media briefing on Tuesday, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, uh, Dr. Patrick Kuma Abwaji, noted recoveries still stand at 494. The Greater Accra region has a total case count of 3,981. We have recorded as at this uh, morning, I mean, waking from the data from the 11th of May, 427 new cases, bringing our total to about three Bringing our total to yes, sir, 5,127. Uh, we just have mixed up. The total new cases from the 9th was 277, um, 160 for the 10th, and we have two, 427 new cases for uh, yesterday. Out of that, 272 of them has come from Obuasi Township alone. 1,074 has come from routine surveillance, and then 1,538 has come from the enhanced surveillance, which we continue to do. Our total recoveries, as of today, is 494, and we have about 180 awaiting their second negative test, which will give us, which will increase the number of recoveries. That brings our active, case, active cases to 4,611. And as I mentioned the last time, the 4,000 active cases are those that are still in management, either they are in isolation, either in a special isolation center, isolation at home, or they are in our facilities being cared for. 4,006 and six of them are currently responding to treatment and five are critically ill at our various health centers, mainly in Accra. I will just um, go into the core uh, cases as uh, we have them raging. Greater Accra, is recording a total of 3,981, an increase of 89, and I'll get into more details when we get to the district levels. Ashanti has moved from 355 to 62, with a new case of um, 307. Central region had an increase of 37, bringing their total to 154. Western region had three new cases, so they are now 52. Eastern had no new case, so they are still at 99. Upper West had no new case. Upper East had no new case. OT had no new case. 
and that's for the region, that's Western, Northeast, uh, Northern, and Bono, no new cases uh, as of yesterday. 26 districts have been affected in Greater Accra. The current hotspot, that is where we really have new cases, are uh, Tema Metro, which I will get to again, the house heat maps, Kole Klote, Accra Metro, and Pong Katamansu. Tema Metro has become a major spot where we need to take a crucial cut. And um, the Tema cases, uh, the 533 that, were, that came up the last three or so days, we've had to do a retesting of those because they've done about two weeks. Currently, about 187 of that number have been tested. 50 of that number have turned negative, and we are hoping that by the next, we'll do the next two batches. We'll still have a lot of recoveries out of that group. Right, so our correspondent, uh, William Evans Incom, uh, is in the Ashanti region. He's joining us on Skype for some update of uh, the situation in Obwasi and Ashanti region area. So, Evans, good afternoon. Thanks very much. I can see in your background a uh, forest area. Uh, what's, what's responsible for this backdrop? Uh, well, it has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with a uh, hmm. uh, growing number of cases in the Obwasi. Uh, but they had everything to do with serenity. Um, we needed a very good place so we can tell the Obwase story Great. very well. Mm. And, uh, so Stephen, I can tell you that from what I'm getting from Obwase at the moment, cases are growing beyond 600. Uh, we are still waiting for a confirmation. Um, Latest in the next two or three hours, we should have a confirmation uh, right. from the uh, district health directorate. But I can tell you at least the sources that have been given us, uh, one would say uh, unadulterated report as far as development on COVID-19 cases. Right, uh, William Evans Inkum, uh, our man in Ashanti region, brings us to speed. With, yeah, so, so Ms. Inkum, uh, I need to just start from the basics. Right now, uh, we're being told by the Ghana Health Service that 272 of the, the cases come from Obwasi alone. And you are telling us that there is a likelihood that this could reach up to 600 from sources uh, that you have spoken to. I want to find out whether these sources have given us a possible reason behind the rise in numbers in Obwasi. It is, it is, it is a well-known I mean, I mean, uh, problem. Or uh, one would say an impeccable error um, when the partial lockdown was announced. Remember, Obasi was the first district to have recorded a case in the Ashanti region, but that place wasn't part of the partial lockdown. So it is assumed that people still had the disease, but because scientists have made us understand that some people may not be showing some level of signs, even though they may test positive, that is asymptomatic. Uh, uh, kind of people, um, that could have led to the widespread of the COVID and then the astronomical increasing of cases uh, within the last couple of days. And uh, I mean, it's something that maybe the, the, the official or the authority will have to come and explain why the uh, why Obwase wasn't part of the initial plan. Now, aside that, Certain measures that the Kumasi Metro had put in place to uh, curb or control the spread, Obwase is now implementing those measures. One has to do with the closure of markets. It was only three days ago that the major market centers were closed. And now they are thinking of running a rotational system, a system that is in the books and, of course, it is being implemented by the Kumasi Metro for uh, about three weeks now, Obwase, which is the epicenter in the Ashanti region, is now implementing those um, measures. So you could see clearly that there is so much lateness when it comes to uh, tackling or being showing some level of proactiveness mm. uh, in dealing with the cases or COVID-19 cases. Well, some of us don't want to believe that there was some level of, one is a complacency but from the figures that we are getting, I think it points to that direction, Stephen.
Mm. So, so, Mr. Nkum, I, I want, to, want to assess the levels of compliance with the safety protocols within Obwasi itself. It was, we have, you and I have spoken extensively about adherence to social distancing within Kumasi and uh, Greater Kumasi and contiguous areas, etc. But what about Obwasi? You, you mentioned that uh, because Obwasi was not part of the lockdown, possibly their behaviours in terms of adherence to these social uh, distancing protocols have not been good enough. What's your assessment of these uh, adherence to these protocols? Now, something that the people in Kumasi and uh, Greater Kumasi have learned um, over, uh, I mean, over time, Obwasi is now going to learn that. And, and, and you will, should understand, already we, we are talking about a certain cultural construct that is making it very difficult for people to adhere to the social distancing protocol. Mm. Sometimes it's not about somebody trying to, or deliberately not complying with this, but it's something that they have lived for a very long time. Kumasi or Ashanti is a traditional time, a, a traditional town, a traditional uh, enclave. So people will want to shake hands and all of that just to show some mm. level of respect and all of that. But that thing has been uh, taken out of their everyday life because of the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. Uh, inadvertently, uh, Obwase now will have to uh, do that. And I can tell you, sometimes when you, you find people maybe forgetting themselves and doing what we've been asked not to do, Sometimes you cannot blame them so much. I'm talking about Obwase. It's because now they are now beginning to learn. In, in Kumase, it has become part and parcel of life. It has become the new culture that people have adapted to. But Obwase, it is something that they are now going to learn because they were not part of the original uh, measures. So if you, are, if you are asking what could have accounted for the increasing numbers of uh, cases as far as uh, uh, Obwase is concerned, you cannot mention any reason without leaving what I am telling you mm. uh, aside. I can imagine. Now, you, you also earlier reported on the resistance from the residents in the use of a private facility as a holding center for people who have been infected with the coronavirus. Uh, what updates can you give us on that? Well, so um, the um, district um, security council, I'm talking about Obwasi East District, because uh, Akapoisu Force under Obwasi is the district. And then that of the COVID-19 team have stood resolute to ensure that that particular facility that was made available by a private developer is used or converted into uh, an isolation center. Now, I can tell you that the, in the neighborhood, the people who were earlier protesting or agitating vehemently against uh, the conversion are now, or more or less, living in an isolation. It's like a self-imposed restriction because nobody is coming out because of the fact that now uh, they, they, they are beginning to understand that, quote-unquote, they are strangers among them. And for that matter, they cannot, uh, I mean, they, they cannot live with them. For, uh, for some days now, they've been put, protesting against their coming into that particular enclave. But now they are there, but the residents who were earlier re resisting um, they are coming to that particular place are now indoors and they are, they are not coming out for fear of contracting the disease. Right. Uh, Ms. Enkum, we're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely uh, for that report. William Evans Enkum is a reporter in Ashanti region, bringing us up to speed with the situation in Obwasi and surrounding areas, as well as this general situation in the Ashanti region. Now, the director in charge of public health at the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Bedou Sarkodie, has been explaining the figures in detail. Among the cases, 22 have died. This brings to a case fatality of 0.43%. The case fatality rate of 0.43%. The age range for the deaths is from 9 years to 82 years. The youngest is 9 year old and the oldest 82 years. The mean age is 55.5 years and the median age 
58 years. I've mentioned the mean and median. Those are interested very much in statistics. The median age for the male, mean age for males is 52.4 compared with 58.1 for females. Clearly, there is clear preponderance of the deaths for the males and the death rate proportion or the ratio of the male to female is 2.14 is to 1.00. Males are also are having the highest number of deaths in all age groups with the exception of 25 to 34 years where death rate is the same. There are charts for this later you can share with you as separate. Now we're mentioning all along that most of the deaths are associated comorbidities. We have done some analysis of this and out of the 22 deaths that we have recorded, 90.9%, close to 21% have comorbidity and 9.1% don't have any comorbidity. And the coronavirus pandemic has brought about changes in care for patients at the Accra Psychiatric Hospital. Medical director of the facility says arrangements have been put in place uh, to ensure the safety of all who use the facility. Right from the entrance of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, one is greeted with a bold inscription, no face marks, no entry. Next, the hospital's COVID response team is on standby to check temperature of either visitors, staff or patients. Medical Director of the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, Dr. Pinamana Pau, noted that before Ghana started recording cases, many patients were discharged. Even before we recorded a case in the country, we tried to discharge as many patients as possible to go home, and down on admission to the barest minimum, so that we don't go and add on to um, the inpatients that we have. Now, she tells me, any patient who comes in for care is kept in an observation for 14 days. Patients are admitted only in critical situations. Someone who is admitted really, really needs admission or cannot be managed at home at all. So we, we, we admit them and even then we do not admit straight onto the ward. Dr. Pao says because of the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of things have changed at the facility. If the patient has a fever, we don't allow them to come into this OPD. We, we keep them, we have another OPD down there where those with um, fever goes to, and then a doctor goes to see them. They have limited patients to doctor contact. What doctors now are doing is they are looking into doing more of um, phone consultations so that um, when the patients come in here, instead of maybe giving them one month for them to come back for review, they give them longer periods and then they follow up on, uh, on them on phone. We followed up to two of the wards. We observed inmates were not seen as pertained in the past. And those who were out taking a nap were separated from one another, obviously observing physical distancing protocol. Dr. Pinamanapal said all these arrangements are to protect inmates, visitors and health personnel. Even though, she says, there has been much improvement at the hospital, they are still faced with some human resource challenges. She therefore urged all to adhere to directives put in place by management to ensure the safety of all. And police in Tesano is seeking public support in tracing the whereabouts of a 30-year-old man, Richard Safo Ajimai. Uh, uh, Richard reportedly left their Abekan residence on April 14 and has since not 
returned. Efforts by the family and the police to trace him have proved futile. Anyone who has seen Richard Safwaji mine should please contact the Tessano Divisional Police Command or the nearest police station. Volunteers may also use the police emergency numbers of 191 or 18555 to assist. Let's still midday live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda. Remember, we're streaming live on Facebook and on 3news.com, and you can catch TV3 on DSTV channel 279. We'll be right back with more news. Welcome back to the business segment on Midday Live. The Ghana Maritime Authority is heading to court to seek an order to destroy seized wooden boats used for illegal fuel trade along the coast of Central and the Takradi Enclave. Director General of the Authority, Thomas Kofi Alonzi, said uh, the law will make the business unattractive to engage in fuel smuggling and protect fuel consumers from uh, substandard products. He spoke exclusively to Josephine Enchi Ejay. Illegal bunkering is done at night at the blind side of authorities. The illegality had assumed alarming proportions with more people in the trade. Locally called Adende, illegal boats are built without certification to use or to go to sea with. And disguised as fishing boats, these massive wooden vessels have the storage capacity of 10,000s of litres. Thongs of fuel is pumped from the tankers into the local boats which sail to different beaches and discharge their content into awaiting road fuel tankers. Large quantities of fuel, mostly diesel, spills on the beaches, which also cause pollution to the water. The illegally procured fuel, which is usually of low quality, ends up on the market, having escaped the regulatory scrutiny and quality assurance from the National Petroleum Authority, NPA, imposing a serious risk to vessels. The Director General of the Ghana Maritime Authority, Thomas Alonzi, says the boat owners have violated the authority's law, which requires them to obtain permits. For any ship to engage in ship to ship transfer of oil, you need an approval from the Ghana Maritime Authority. The guys involved in this illicit business are becoming so courageous and brave that they don't even see the activity as illegal. First and foremost, for even a boat of that size to be manufactured, you need a permit from the Ghana Maritime Authority. At various stages of the construction, the authority ought to do inspections. But these things, they don't, they don't involve the authority in any way. So we, we, are no, we, are, we are in no doubt whatsoever that once we come across any of such boats, they can even be arrested. Thomas Alonzi added the state had been denied of large amount of revenue and regulators have also lost levies through the street. And uh, we've been able to seize a number of them. But uh, where we have kept them at the moment, the place appears to be flooded with huge numbers of those confiscated uh, boots. So we now have a challenge of getting rid of them. So we have taken a decision to go to court to have an order of the court to dispose of them by way of destruction. That is the step we want to take. The authority has stepped out night patrols, which is leading to more arrests. On May 9th, more than 200 of sad boats were impounded during a swoop with the police at 2nd D. The distraction, they intimated, will serve as a deterrent to many. Josephine and GAJ, TV3 News. And the survival of cocoa farms continue to be under threat following activities of illegal mining. Chief Executive of South Cocoa Board, Joseph Boahin Edu, called on the security agencies to up their operations against Galamse in order to save the cocoa industry. 
to inspect the progress of the ongoing mass pruning exercise, the chief executive officer of Cocoa Board, Joseph Buahin Edu, decried the destruction of cocoa farms by operators of Galamse. The cocoa, which is the backbone of the country, so more or less it's the economy of the country that is being destroyed. And these are clear saboteurs. Yet we have recalcitrant uh, citizens who are, you know, uh, still bent on engaging in illegal mining. If the backbone of the economy is destroyed, then what is the fate of this country? It's sad. And um, I think the uh, security agencies will have to, uh, you know, step up their, their activity, their operations on these illegal miners. Because if you are not careful, they will destroy the entire uh, cocoa industry. The sustainability of the cocoa industry in Ghana continues to be challenged by the activities of illegal miners. These cocoa farms look like trenches dug by soldiers during war times. The impact of Galamse on cocoa farms is beyond description. Frightened at the approach of the cocoa board team on their base of operation, the miners quickly took to their heels in different directions, leaving behind their tools and machinery. Coco plays an important role in Ghana's growth and poverty reduction as some 800,000 farm families are employed in the sector. Everywhere we go, farmers are complaining that um, they are finding it very hectic dealing with these Galamsey operators. They come, farmers are not interested to give their land. The next time they go to their farms, the farms had been already invaded and then vandalized. You know, we cannot have a lawless society. It cannot be so. I'm using the opportunity to call on the security agency to step up their efforts in dealing with Galamse. The crop generates about $2 billion in foreign exchange annually and is a major contributor to government revenue and GDP for Ghana. And that's it for business on Midday Live. But let's take one more story, uh, which is non-business. Uh, before we go on a break, government has vehemently indicated it will not take advantage of the COVID-19 pandemic to extend its first term mandate. Information Minister Kojo Ponkroma at a news conference on Tuesday maintained several countries in Africa have managed to hold elections despite the pandemic and that government will follow suit if the killer virus persists until December 7. Government takes note of commentary suggesting that some possible governance arrangements can be appropriate should it become impossible to hold elections in December. But the government does not contemplate any justifiable reason to seek to extend its first term constitutional mandate with the virus as an excuse without a safe, free and fair election. The government is of the view that instead of contemplating measures that are not envisaged in the Constitution, our best energies, our innovation, our creativity should be invested in exploring how a country like ours can have safe, free and fair elections. If countries like South Korea did it around the 15th of April, Mali did it on the 29th of March and I think 19th of April, uh, if Ivory Coast and Burundi and America and Serbia are all exploring how to do this, Ghana should also invest its energies in exploring how to do so and to do so successfully. This is still midday live from our studios at Adesawe. This is some entertainment news now. Takradi based rapper Kofi Kinata has revealed while delving into the ills of religion in the country in his hit song Things Fall Apart, he also took a swipe at himself. <laughs> Things Fall Apart, released in October 2019, ended the year as the biggest and most controversial song. It highlighted religion and questioned if people were really worshipping God. Apparently, Kofi Kinata also questioned his personal relationship with God in the song, which won a song of the year at the 2023 Music Awards. He disclosed in an interview with Ms. G on TV3 New Day that the line in the songs that attacks part-time Christians was directed at himself. I went through shot at myself. The whole part-time Christian thing was for me. Yeah, sometimes you feel you feel ashamed and the guilt will, will not let you even say you are a Christian. Like, the, your kind of lifestyle doesn't suit a Christian. So 
we are part time Christians and now also the Jehovah thing. You know when the Jehovah Witness people uh, have been there before, I've done that before, and I, I'm not proud of that, and I'm done with that. When, nowadays, when they are coming, I listen to them. Interestingly, the rapper's father is a preacher of the Church of Christ. When he started rap, his father wasn't enthused about his choice of career because of the negative perceptions that came with it. For this woman, I think he's very proud of me because when I started doing the rap, rap, and when I started doing music, you know, the previous musicians, they had some perception for the previous musicians, so he didn't want me to do that. So there was a back and forth and argument and stuff like that. But... And on that beautiful Things Fall Apart note, we wrap up with Midday Live. Thanks very much for staying with us. On behalf of the crew here, good afternoon. There's more news at 3news.com. Thanks for your time.